If we, all right, if we can grab a seat, everyone. Thank you so much. So appreciate the fellowship that we have one with another. And it's great seeing everyone. Praise the Lord. We did want to take out some time this morning. Um, and we want to before Mike comes up and speaks. But uh, just a moment for us just to pray. As you know, today is 9-11 and um, the anniversary, I believe it's the 22nd anniversary of um, what happened here in the United States. Uh, and so we just want to take a moment just to pray for those families. I was reading some articles this morning and uh, just all the, you know, the stories and the lives that were totally changed on that day as a result of the attack uh, that we had on our country, uh, but we're grateful for God's mercy and grace, good stories, hearing from the families who lost loved ones during that day, and uh, God's mercy and kindness is still good. So let's, let's just pray for those families and, and just ask God for his continued safety for us as a country. So Father, we thank you. Lord, this is a day that we always remember uh, Father, on what happened on 9-11. And Lord, we, we don't ever want to forget that. Father, we, we're grateful for the freedoms that we have in our country. Lord, we continue to trust you with our country. And then, Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name that you would, I know it's been a long time. I know that time, quote, can heal wounds. But Lord, the loss of a loved one, a mother, a father, a child. Uh, Lord, those are devastating times. And so, Lord, I just pray for your continued grace as many families will reflect today on losing their husbands, wives, daughters, sons. Lord, I just pray for an extra measure of grace for them. And, Lord, we thank you. We ask, God, your, for your continued prep. Uh, protection on us as a country, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, make sure that you take time to reflect on where you were on that particular day, and uh, we thank God for that. Uh, today is a very special day. Mike, go ahead and come on up. Uh, Mike Gillen is, is a dear friend, but he's not only a good friend. Mike served with me here at Abundant Grace for 17 years. And uh, yeah, That's it. I did it. yep. So many of uh, many of you know Mike, love Mike, and uh, but part of the, like I said, the twenty-five and five is to bring back some men that uh, and their wives, because Cindy served uh, alongside K and I for seventeen years here. But I've known Mike; he was here for seventeen years. I served with him in Orlando for seven years, but then was there for two more, so that's 26, and then I knew you before that, plus these, so, wow, man, we're at 30 years. Yeah, we go back to 1985, so, and we're still friends. That's amazing, isn't it, uh, that we can be friends that long and love those guys, but uh, Mike, just, I know I've told you privately and Cindy as well, but I want to tell you publicly, thank you for how you come alongside, and first of all, moved your family from Orlando up here at year five for us as a church, and then for 17 years, raised your family in Gainesville and serving the people of Abundant Grace and, and really helping me, Mike. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for everything. I, words are never enough, but you know how much I love you. Cindy, you know how much we love you. And uh, we're just grateful, and I'm thankful for you, brother. And I'm so glad you're here today. I'm excited about what you're going to bring. So, I love you, brother. All right. I thought I did. There it is. All right, now it was on. The mic is off, but the, it's on. It's on and it's off. There we go. I'm set. It's really great for us to be here. It's good to see friends. Uh, to meet some new ones. It is really an honor to be invited for such a celebration as this because we really do love this church. You don't spend 17 years of your life uh, at a place without, uh, when you leave, 
leaving a part of your heart behind. And that is exactly what happened to Cindy and me uh, when we moved back to Orlando in 2019. Uh, I can honestly tell you that we're grateful for those years here. I will never forget the opportunity uh, that I had to be a part of this congregation and will always hold dear in my heart Phil and Kay and their role in our lives for allowing me to be a part of the team and to uh, make the many relationships that will go on now, I know, for the rest of my life. So it's a joy for Cindy and me to be here. We just celebrated our 46th anniversary. Uh, excited about that. Our anniversary is uh, the same day as Phil's birthday. So uh, that is uh, uh, easy for us to remember. And uh, we got married in the revolutionary year of 1976 when we were um, having our bicentennial. Cindy and I, uh, we had our own revolution that year, and we got married, and it was wonderful, uh, and what a gift of God she is to me. So it, it is really a whole bunch of happy feels that we come here with today, and it's an honor to meet you. Those of you that we don't know would love to meet you at the end. Uh, Phil has asked me to speak on the church as a body, and I'm going to be able to do that from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll begin in a moment with verse 12 through verse 27. Uh, several points, though, I'd like to make kind of in introduction to this, uh, this passage. Paul, you see in this, this particular chapter, and in, in, in a bigger way uh, to the whole Corinthian church, is bringing a, what is nothing less than a letter of correction. Uh, this church, well, quite frankly, they were a hot mess in a lot of different areas, and they needed, they needed some uh, work of uh, adjustment, and Paul brought that. I don't know if that's me. I'm not, I'm not sensing it. If it is, I'm not doing anything, unless it's just my electric personality that's coming it. out. Yeah. <laughs> Causing an internal short just by speaking. There we go. Uh, he, he wrote this chapter uh, as a way in this letter, as a way of, of uh, really addressing people that were very dear to him, but needed some direction from the Lord. And so that's what he did. They needed it. It's comforting to realize, though, that as much as they needed some of the corrections that the Corinthians uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians brought to them. Paul never lost his faith for them. Paul never lost his love for them. That is uh, definitely different. So I, am, I don't think I'm doing anything unless the connection is being pulled. So we'll try and persevere here. All right, sorry about that. Um, Years ago, I heard an illustration that I believe applies well to the Corinthians and to this passage, and it was this. Whenever there are issues like there were in Corinth, where there were abuses going on, there were doctrinal, you can read about them, they're very well documented, very well preached about, uh, there were things going on that should not have been going on, but wherever there are abuses, many people take the wrong answer, the wrong antidote to those abuses. And somebody said it like this, wherever there's been abuse, the corrective action to take is not misuse or disuse. But the right way to look at it is to take the correct use. And the correct use is what Paul was giving the Corinthians. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. It's not to stop doing everything. I mean, they were abusing the spiritual gifts. Uh, they were uh, highlighting spiritual gifts one over another, especially tongues. And they, they, were, they were abusing, in some ways, some of these spiritual gifts. But uh, I, I can tell you right now that Paul never told them to stop using the spiritual gifts. He just said, use them correctly. That's the tone of his writing. The focus was for them to see who they were in the Lord and for them to have the right orthopraxy, that is, the right 
practice or conduct in their day-to-day lives. That's what Paul's heart was for them. And he was such a patient leader. One might expect that where there was such disorder in the congregation that he might have them sit back and stop using some of these spiritual gifts. But he actually, in 1 Corinthians 14, tells them not to be refused. Do not forbid these gifts from taking place. So I think that is a very helpful realization that we need to always remember the gifts are important. They're given. And what we're going to see in this passage today, how they are to serve and what they are, what they're to do. And so we're going to look at that as we read. So right now, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with 12. We will have this up on the screen. I think this might be pulling. I think that's part of the problem. It might be pulling on this. So I'm going to make a slight adjustment here. And maybe that will give it some slack. I think, yeah. I think that's it. I think because every time I look up and then look down and then look back up, it's shorting. Yeah, okay, let's try that. All right, let's read along. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make it that would not make it any less a part of that body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Verse 27 Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I pause for the reading of your word at the end of this reading to say thank you for the word. Thank you for Paul's love for this church that he dearly loved and held in his heart. And Lord, we here today are part of a local church that we love. And we ask that you would open up this passage to our understanding, that we can realize how important each individual member of this local congregation really is. Open our eyes, open our ears to the greater harvest that you have for us, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. The gifts mentioned earlier in chapter 12, we didn't read those Uh, But those are given for a context that basically is the broader sense of context for this chapter that we've just read, this passage that we've just read, the verses. Gifts are given for our common good. These are gifts, again, that Paul is talking about that are not earned. These aren't something that we qualify for. These gifts that God has given us in 1 Corinthians 12 were given for a purpose in our lives, a purpose to per- perform the will of God through our lives, and in the corporate sense, through the context of this local church. 
That's why God gave these gifts. They're for the purpose of becoming the people that he's called us to be. There's a commentator called Bruce Fisk uh, that has kind of given us a, a picture, a metaphor that I'd like to look at today, and I've ma- built a little graphic, and I'd like to show it to you. It's, it's called the gifts of the Spirit, and when we look at these gifts that are given for this common good, we, we're going to see a couple of reasons why God gave them. Number one, there's a bookend that verse 7 serves. And as that bookend comes in and props up this side of it in verse 7, we find from Paul that he, he, God has given these gifts to us. They're the manifestation of the Spirit of God, and they are there for the church. They're there for our common good. So that props up one side of the books, if you will, of the gifts of the Spirit. And then verse 11 is a mirroring bookend, if you will. And that is verse 11 where Paul teaches that these gifts are all activated by the one same Spirit. So the Spirit of God activates them as He chooses. So He gives the church wonderful gifts for his purpose, for the common good of the church, according to the plan that he has chosen. So if you wonder why you have a certain way of inclination, a gift in your life, you can thank God for that, because that was the Spirit of God that gave that to you. Now, he didn't just give it to you. Here's the key, and here's the context. He didn't just give that gift to you for you. He didn't give that gift to you for your family only. They will benefit and you will benefit. But he gave that gift to you for the common good of the local church. And that is an important realization. That is something that we really need to see. So with this passage, I'm going to look at three divisions that we need to consider today. Three points that we will examine. Number one, That fact is that he wants there to be unity in the body of Christ, number one. Number two, he's going to give us how we actually have our entrance into the body of Christ. And then thirdly, God's intended harmony that the church is to experience uh, as a part of being in the body of Christ. So let's look at number one. Unity in the body of Christ. Paul gives us this picture of a body. It's a funny picture. It's actually uh, a lot of humor. If you look at Paul's way of using this metaphor, he really capsulizes on uh, humor in several ways in talking about the body. You know, I think it's just generally speaking, when we look at the body, I'm really grateful our body parts are where they are. Can you imagine how weird it would be that if up here on this part of our body, our head, all we had were eyes. I thought of that. How crazy that would be if we had just like one row or another of eyes. There would be no balance to that. There would be no, uh, there would be no purpose as we know it today. We need, we need to have other members up there on our face, right? Not just eyes. We need to have our nose. We need to have our ears. So there's, there's a lot of humor that he, he goes in in this chapter, into describing this analogy. It's truly a wonder to me, as we've learned about the body, and we've done that really greatly in medical science uh, in recent years with the advent of understanding the DNA code and realizing how much particular care that God gave in making you and making me. When you think about not only do we look different, the fact that every human being on your fingertip is a fingerprint that is unique to every other human being in all of life. You can be identified if you have an iPhone, you may have one of those touch uh, buttons that you touch it on my new Mac. I've got one of those. I can just touch it and turn it on by my fingertip. It's unique. But much deeper than that, if we go into the DNA, every person's DNA structure is unique. And there are are chains, if you will, in the DNA, which might tie you and that might actually group you with your own family members. And you can be told whether or not you are 
part of a family or not by that DNA. The uniqueness of God. He knows you inside out. He knows you at the surface level of your skin, and he made you for a purpose. He made this body to be what it is. Now think about it. Let's just look at the human body for a moment. We know that man's sin and rebellion have made many blind to this fact today, but still, if you're a doctor and you've studied the human body, you've got to be impressed at God's handiwork. First of all, God gave us these aspects of our body. Look at them. Eyes that see, ears that hear, noses that smell, legs that can move, walk, and bear our weight, arms that reach, hands that can touch. I think it's doing this again here. (laughs) My goodness, I apologize for this. I'll try to pull this out. And that's such a distraction, and I apologize. So I'm going to... I hope that won't be a problem. I think when you tucked it in your shirt. Pardon? When you tucked it in your shirt. Okay. Yeah, well, we're, gonna, we're just going to drop it. Yeah, drop it through. And the wonders of live stream got to see an adjustment right there. So we have these wonderful parts of our body. Again, it was talking about eyes that see, ears that hear, noses that smell, legs that move, arms that reach, hands that touch. They all have a function. They all have to keep going to make this body work. We need them all. You can't do, you don't want to do without one of them. You know, I, as a guitar player, I have feared for many times in my life when I would almost have an accident that would affect one of my hands because, you know, I realize in that moment, I, my granddad had one of those things happen when he was a young man. He was cutting something on a, on a saw blade and got too close to the blade and cut off the end of his finger. Now, for my grandfather, that was a painful experience, but it healed, and his friends probably called him nubby after that. I'm not sure, but he was okay. But if you're a guitar player, that would not be okay. It would affect what you do. It would affect your abilities to perform that instrument and to play that instrument. So, you know your finger, your one little joint, that fingertip, to some of you may not be that important, you think, but to those of us that play an instrument, it would be so important because that tip of your finger, as small as it is, carries a major function in your life if that is the gift that God has given you. Uh, A writer by the name of Roy Lauren said this, the hand has one operation, The eye has another operation. The ear has yet another diverse operation. But all the diversity becomes a unity, for the whole body functions as one. The body does not function as many members, but many members function as one body. Paul then makes the tie-in statement. So also is Christ. So also is Christ. Just like we have all of these parts, and they're all part of one body, they're all individual. They're all different gifts. They all carry separate functions. Maybe some of them bear weight, and others have the ability to see clearly, but they all are different. So that is the way it is with the body of Christ, the church. We are all functioning through Christ when we work together as the body of believers. Just as our arms and our ears and our legs and our feet and our hands, they all work together in the will of the Lord and everyone does its role and its function, so also in this church, every individual member of this church is intended to work together 
to bring unity, working together with diverse giftings, bringing about the unified purpose of God. So that's the body of Christ, number one. That's number one. Our number two point, our entrance into the body of Christ. How did we become the people of God? How do we become members? How did that happen? Well, it wasn't an accident. That's the amazing thing about it. God had a plan in that too. He not only made you with all of these giftings that he's given you, but he has a care as to where you are. You know, we did not choose the color of our eyes. I thought I was going to be 6'3". That's what my parents told me when I was a little kid. I'd gone through that baby chart, that Gerber baby chart back when I was a boy. And my dad was 6'2", and we were told that I would be at least 6'2", at least 6'3". And, you know, and I grew up thinking, being from Indiana, I was going to be a basketball player. Had dreams of dunking, and they only stayed in my dreams, I might add. Never was able to do that at all because I found that axiom that the Bible says the wicked will be cut off short. And that's what happened to me. I was cut off short. So I never, I never got to be that height. I never got to have that skill. But, you know, that is not anything that I could have a lot of choice about. You know, you might not like the color of your hair or the color of your eyes or the fact that you're right-handed or left-handed or the fact that you need glasses or don't need glasses. There's a lot about us that we really don't have a choice about. God has made that choice for us. Our call into the church is not something that we have randomly chosen either. It is not something that you just one day woke up and think, well, I'm going to do this. Well, we, it's really not to be that way. We really need to recognize that God has a role, not only in how we are, but where we live. Look at a couple of verses. Peter said, first of all, that we were called out of darkness. I want you to know that it matters to God that you're not in darkness. It matters to God that you're not living in the world in the swallower of sin. It mattered to God that you on a Sunday morning are here. Isn't that wonderful to recognize that God cared enough about you that he made a plan for your life. And we think it's the great circumstance or the great... Uh, maybe just like a coincidence. I heard this last week that if that's true, if we live our lives and we find ourselves in coincidence, well, it would be because God is the God who orders coincidence. He, there is no such thing as a coincidence. It is the will of the Lord. So Peter said, we were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Psalm 68, 6, the NIV translation, this is one of my favorite words. I love this. God sets the lonely in families. It wasn't God's plan for you to be alone. He gave us earthly families, but then corporately speaking as a church, we have a church family. Yes, that's right. And God places people in church families. Yes. That's his plan. That's what he does. This was not a random choice. In John 3, we read the very well-known story of Nicodemus, who was told by Jesus that he had to be born again if he wanted to be in the kingdom. So, so this whole idea of now, it's like a new start, a new beginning. When we, we get older and we realize that, wait a minute, in a real way, God has now another plan for me. And we realize that the, his plan, I'm part of his family, and I'm being born into this thing called the kingdom of God. It's a wonderful realization, God's involvement in us. So we're called to, we are born into and we are baptized by His Spirit as we enter into what the Scripture calls a new and living way. No longer apart from the living God, not living out there on our own, not just figuring out life the best we can, but He has a plan, and that plan is going to be revealed, and that plan is going to be made known to us 
in the context of his body. The essence of the gospel then is ours as we receive and believe that it is he who made us to be the sons and daughters of God. I love that. What glorious hope we have in salvation. It's a plan for which we did not earn, did not qualify it by our good deeds, but we were chosen in him to be a member of the church, to be entered into this thing called the body of Christ. And he puts us where we should be, placing us in the family of believers. Uh, Paul, in the book of Galatians, said, do good to all, especially to the household of faith. And if if you take that, that verse in a different translation, household of faith means family of believers. God has put us into a family. We are truly brothers and sisters in God's eyes. That's what he does. He doesn't call the church to be an organization. I want you to know that Abundant Grace is not intended to be the Kiwanis Club. It's not the Exchange Club. It's not a sewing club or a bowling club or an archery club or any kind of club like that. It's not to be an organization. But instead, the church is alive. It's an organism. It's something that God not only gives life to, He equips it with members to be its eyes and ears, its nose and hands, its feet, its arms. God's involvement is all over why you are here. Whether you realize that, whether you appreciate it, whether or not you perceive it, you're still here because of a purpose. Sometimes people wake up to that and think, wow. You know, it's almost like Peter when he was let out of prison by the angel, and it wasn't until he got on the outside and he makes this startling discovery I'm not in jail, I'm free. And the funny thing is, they're all praying for Peter to be released from prison. And he knocks on the door and he goes, hey, it's me, it's Peter. And they don't open the door because they think it's some ghost or something. You know, we can be blind both in our realization about where we are, and we can also be blind in not opening the door to the next thing that God has for us in our life. All because of maybe fear. All because of not knowing what God's plan is. But I can tell you that the scripture here is teaching us that his plan is is that you have a purpose. You have a function. Just like your body has a purpose, it has a function. So we've talked about unity in the body. We've just covered how it is that we enter into that body through the church. And now we look at our third point, God's intended harmony for the body of Christ. He continues in this metaphor of the human body, and he's talking to these Corinthians about this good that comes from when the body, the church, is in harmony with itself. Now, at this stage of the game, I mentioned earlier, Paul goes into some humorous pictures, humorous kind of like little absurdities, if you will. Uh, And he he takes the parts of the body and he humanizes them uh, to the point that they can speak one to another. The parts of our bodies, in other words, carrying on conversations with itself. And he does it because he does not want there to be disunity in the function of our, our members of our body. He wants us to see that the eyes and the ears and all of the other parts of our body are are really quite good at relating one with another because he wants us to avoid what happens to a lot of church bodies where there's jealousy, where there's envy, where there's maybe discord, where there are uh, words that are spoken that should not be spoken about someone else or to someone else. Paul is very careful to keep unity as being something 
that is part of God's plan. He wants there to be harmony in the body of Christ. And he brings up what might have been an unexpected turn of of this picture, the possibility of dissatisfaction that your one body part could possibly, in this analogy, have with another body part. And he goes on to say, how crazy would it be if your foot just got up one morning and your foot suddenly can talk and says, I don't want to be a foot anymore. I'm tired of being walked on. I'm tired of supporting all of that dude's weight. Have you seen how much he weighs? I I don't want that kind of job anymore. And our foot wakes up in the morning and he goes, I want to be a hand. So today I'm going to go walking around. I'm going to, I'm going to do a hand. I'm going to play piano. Now your foot gets up on the piano. You can see what kind of crazy picture Paul is giving us in this analogy. It's humorous. You know, the, the, the toes are not going to be able to do what the fingers can do. At least not my toes. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're not that talented. I know I've seen amazing videos of people who lost their arms and the way they've been able to adapt. There are painters that paint with their feet. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Again, it's, it is quite comical to think about this. Uh, Our hands are pretty amazing, all right. The muscles in your hand, you think about it, you ladies that sew, or I I know that some of you uh, have members of your family that are massage therapists. I've always been amazed at the strength that people can have in their fingers. It's quite amazing what they can do. But our feet were not intended to do those kinds of functions. And how sad it would be if your feet stopped wanting to be your feet. It just would be sad. And similarly, you're not going to see any good come if your eye wanted to stop seeing. Where else are you going to be able to see from or through? You're not going to be able to do that, you know, through your nose. I'm sorry, your nose is gray. (laughs) It's just not going to do that. You know, a a funny thing, we had a a miracle guy came to speak at our church when uh, I was a young boy. And this guy, his name was Ronnie Coyne, and he had been healed in a miraculous way. And he was able to see through an empty eye socket. His sister, I believe it was his sister, was chasing him with chicken wire. And if you've ever used chicken wire, it's real springy. And she was like using it like a whip. And she was slapping him with this chicken wire. And every time she would slap it, it would unfurl and smack him real nice and hard because it's wire. And then it would recoil back to her hands. And they were just doing this over and over. And then she got a little too close to his head. And she snapped that chicken wire, that baling wire, and it unrolled. And the tip of it, which was a barb, plucked him right in the eye. And as it recoiled, it just jerked his eyeball right out. He had no eyeball, no eyeball. And lived through life. They, they, gave, they gave him a, a prosthetic eye, and that was that. So he could see out of his one eye, but I think it was his right eye was good. But his left eye, there was nothing there. And then through a miracle prayer, someone prayed for him and said, I'm going to open your eye. I didn't believe this. You're probably not believing this either. I get it. But here's what he challenged us to do. He had all of the elders of our church come up, and they all took handkerchiefs, and they literally duct taped those handkerchiefs over his good eye. And then he took the prosthetic eye out. And he had challenged people to bring something from their wallet out. So I'm a young man. I did that. I gave him my Social Security card, something I wouldn't even do today. (laughs) But I did, and he read it off without any hesitation. And I want you to know that there were some people who were 
skeptical of the miracle of that. And they said, oh, there's some trickery somehow. Uh, he must be seeing through his nose. Uh, that in itself would be a miracle in my mind. Uh, I'm not sure how that would go or why that's better than just believing God. But this man did that. He read driver's licenses. He read letters. He read books. He read social security numbers. God had performed a miracle because God can cause an eye to see when it was blinded. That's very documented in Scripture. But your, your nose is not going to be able to see. But he gives this absurd picture. What happened if your eye, he said, looked at your hands? And he goes, hey, you down there with those cool fingers and thumbs, I have no need of you. I don't need you anymore. I, I, imagine if that could happen for a moment. What would, what would the hand and the thumb and the other body parts feel, I mean, if, the, if they were told. And yet, the, this is not just a body illustration that Paul has given us. These are real understandings that happen in this body, That's right. in the body of Christ. In, I'm not just talking about only abundant grace. I mean, this has been one of the challenges throughout time. The body needs to realize how much we need to have unity one with another. Paul gives thoughts on those members of the body that are most private and most covered up. Yet the importance of those members, he said, are, are truly to our lives without calculation. We give them the greatest honor. They receive and receive much more modesty than our other presentable parts of our body need because they need it and because it's right and because they are worth that. So Paul's teaching is then wrapped up in these verses. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division. That's the purpose here. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members who have come, that, that may have same care for one another. If one member suffers, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. God wants us to have harmony, not jealousy. He wants us to have harmony, not envy. He wants us to cooperate one with another, not be warring, not be fighting. The Spirit of God through Paul's writing is calling to us, appealing for a mutual care, a mutual empathy, a mutual unity, not to be divided. He's calling for us to recognize that God has placed us together, local churches of believers, in which he plucks people who are lonely, he says, and he puts them into a family of believers, a family that they need, a family from which they'll receive care, a family from which they will grow and, and support and encourage and pray for, and love. May those that don't know Jesus come through the doors of this local church. May they have that sense that we read about in, later in this chapter, in this, or I should say in this book. May they fall down on their knees and declare, God is in this place. Verse 27 Paul comes to an end of our passage today, summing up everything with a single sentence. Now, you are the body of Christ. Individually, members of it. It's not just that you are individuals, you are. There's no question about it. We are individual people, who have been joined together by a God who has placed you in a body. And just like our parts need to work together, we need to work collectively as the body of Christ. I, I love that video we saw today from uh, the, the orphanage and this van and, and the way that this body of Jesus was able to contribute and to make that body supported, loved, cared for. 
That's the privilege of being a part of other churches, is that you can do things together in unity, in power, in strength, that you can't do. And it's just like what happens, isn't it, when one person falls, the Bible says if that person has a friend who will pick them up, then they've got a hand to reach up to and grab a hold of. That's the role that we can play one with another in this church. There was a guy by the name of Russ Taff. He's still around, sang with a group called the Imperials. But then he had a, a great solo career, and during the, um, uh, this would have been the late 70s and early 80s, he had an album that was amazing. And one of the songs on that album was everything that we're talking about today. It was called We Will Stand. And I've got the lyrics. I want to read them to you. This is verse 2. The day will come when we will be as one. And with a mighty voice together, we will proclaim that Jesus, Jesus is king. It will echo through the earth. It will shake the nations. And the world will see that you're my brother, you're my sister. So take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. And here's why. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. God wants us to stand. I've got some application questions I'm going to put up on the screen. These would be good for your group discussion. These are great to ask yourselves, where am I on these things? And here they are. What gifts has God given you? How will you use those gifts for the common good, for the benefit of others in the church? Are there fellow believers that you're tempted to look down on, just like that example of the eye saying to the hands, what, I don't need you. Are, are there believers in the, in the church that at times the enemy would love to come and make us break that unity and to say things that we shouldn't say, look down on them in word or deed? What would it look like instead if we all just prayed for those that we had those feelings for? What a difference that would be. Are you isolated or insulated in the body of Christ? Don't be alone. Don't be that hand saying, I don't have need of you. I'm just going to separate and, and do my handy thing over here. That's what I'm going to do. No, nope, don't do that. Don't be insulated from the other members of the body. Be together. Be the body. What part of the body are you functioning as today? And, and I do believe this can change in different seasons of our life. We don't always do the very same thing all our entire lives. What is that role that you're to play? In the last month, did you share with someone an area or need in your life? That is a wonderful, wonderful way to express the need for the body, is to come up to somebody and say, I need you. I need you to speak into my life. In this last month, did you express gratitude to another member for something that they did, something that they said, or what in general they mean to you? That's a really great thing to do. Do you have a sign over your neck that says, no help wanted? If so, take it off because you need it. You need to have a sign that says, help needed. <laughs> I need you. If someone asks you, how can I help you this week? Would you be embarrassed? Would you be offended? These are questions that we can ask because we don't want the kind of disunity that Paul gave us in this chapter. We don't want hands saying to feet or eyes saying to, to fingers, I have no need of you. I don't want to be a part of you. We want to be together. Yeah. We want there to be unity. Worship team's going to come. What an honor it is for me to have been a part for 17 years of this body of Christ. 
Thank you for that. Thank you for the privilege I had for that. Thank you for your love and the way you love not only me, my wife, our children, uh, put up with all the things that that all brings about in our lives together. It, it was such an amazing experience. I have great faith for the body of Christ here in Gainesville at Abundant Grace. God bless you.